This is Karen Tall here at the Cold Water Steampunk Festival, and today I'm demonstrating paper mache. I'm also known as Copper Dragon in the steampunk world. So I'm showing you a slightly different method of paper mache application, starting with an armature, and my application is a little bit different in how I actually work with the paper itself. So here are a few examples that I've created that show the different types of surfaces that you can use and how refined you can get with paper mache or how creative you can be. So in this case, this is a piece that I'm working on that does have the wire armature in process. And this piece is more completed with some paper pulp to get a very fine surface. Many, many layers of paper mache and paper pulp over here. This is a little bit more of a, a rough application where you're looking for texture. So the paper applied and then treated and then painted. So a gesso prime just to make sure that you seal it correctly before painting. And then this is actually Fimo or polymer clay or Sculpey brand uh, would work, any of the polymer clays. And so these are scales that are actually rolled in what's called the Millefori technique, which is um, a very traditional Italian uh, meaning of thousand flowers, where you roll up pieces and slice off individual pieces to make the scales. And then this is larger sheets of paper that are scrunched up and form the tail. And then again, this one is painted, and this does have the armature, which is a good idea when you have anything that is either thin or needs to be supported. So this needs to support the weight of the fish. And this, of course, needs to be bent around a particular form. So if you want anything suspended, then you definitely want to have some kind of a wire armature. So this is what I chose to use, which is wire hangers. And I actually left the hangers in their natural form because that's close to the shape of the head that I'm looking for. So it's just a convenient way. Of course, you can bend the wires into any shape possible. And I just started by wrapping a little bit of the masking tape around to secure it and then a little bit of the wire. So I like to use the masking tape and foil method, uh, particularly because I may be working on a couple of projects at the same time and it's very quick to be able to do that. So if you're cutting wires, remember to have your safety goggles and to have gloves on so that you're not hurting yourself. So now I'll be securing this base a little bit more so that the shape is closer to a head shape. So I can add smaller pieces or smaller shapes and secure them and then build up. So some of my paper mache layers are actually masking tape layers, which is convenient for me. So that's my preferred method quite often because it's very quick and I can do some quick shaping. Sometimes I have an idea in my head about what I'm building. I need to build an octopus. Other times I just do some freeform shapes like this creature that uh, turned out to be more of a fantasy bug where I wasn't so worried about you know, being perfect in terms of exactly the shape, exactly the size, and whether it's correct, because it is, of course, fantasy. If you're doing something that is a little bit more precise, then, of course, you want to measure things out and make sure that your armature or your base is making sense for whatever you're creating. So I'm just adding my final piece here, just to make sure that the wires are supported and not poking out. And then I'm also using the foil here for the in-between part. So that will cover that. So for the sake of demonstration, I'll just move on to the foil explanation. Because you'd want to put a little bit more structure in this and secure it a little bit better with the tape. And for that middle part, I would use some foil. Not exactly 
super traditional. If you wanted to stick with the super traditional method, then you would, of course, work with just the paper and paper pulp. But this is fantastic when you have uh, either a deadline or you want to help in the process of, of drying and building very quickly because you can form. And it's also pretty safe. So you can actually even use foil as a mini armature where you know you maybe don't want to work with the wires or depending on the age of the artist, it's, it's another option. Okay. So when I'm happy with that shape, then I'd have to go down to the legs to flush them out because it would be a challenge to try to add just the paper mache layers to the wire, of course. So I would start with the larger area and then wind. And that attaches quite well, like that. So there you go. And then I apply to each leg until I'm happy with the shape. So in this case, you can see that I've already added some of the paper mache layers building the form. So it's quite rigid, not just from the actual armature, but from the foil and the paper mache that has dried. So I'm going to build on this. And this has a dry layer. So I need to make sure that I'm soaking that first layer. So I have a slightly different method that I like to use, which could be a little bit um, faster, maybe even cleaner, which uses a brush, as opposed to what you may have seen um, long ago in school, where you take big wads of newspaper, soak them in the flour paste, and then, just, you know, just cover everything completely. Very messy. It works. It's fun. But flour can get moldy, and they used to use wallpaper paste, which has fungicides, so you want to avoid that. I would go with an art paste that is safe, so a non-toxic art paste. But you could also mix in white glue. To, to get a different um, type of paste as, as well. So I'm choosing some different shapes of paper, which is important when I'm modeling because I need to either get around corners or into small spaces, so it gives me a variety of shapes to work with. So if you're working with any type of paper, you'll notice that there's a grain. So when I want strips, I'll go with the grain, and then I get my long strips and I can break them into different sizes. When I want pieces or sections in a flat layer, then I'd go against the grain because I'm going to get a random shape. And sometimes even a shape like this can help you to wrap around something or give you some options when you're building. So I'm starting with my paste and I'm using the brush, soaking this with the paste. So this is soaking through, and if you have maybe a few areas, you can start adding some of this paste because this is untreated, it's just the layers of paper mache. So it'll soak through, and then I'll get to my next layer. And I have two, two options here. So I can put on a dryer layer like this, and move over it like that, and that will penetrate. And then I can build really, really quickly. And as long as I allow some time in between and don't do too many layers, then it'll soak through and it'll dry. If I need to really get something super saturated, then I can do the dip method this way, but then to just kind of sweep it off a little bit if I need more paste. So there are options, it's what's comfortable. This is similar to a, a decoupage type idea where when you're applying layers of paper, you'd have the first layer, the paper layer, and then a seal layer. Or if you're using Mod Podge or some other type of um, sealer or um, glue that works in layers, you'd want to do the first layer, attach the paper, and then the final seal coat. So this would smooth out all the individual sections here. And I'm making sure that I'm overlapping and not having big gaps and then smoothing out. So I'm smoothing out with the brush and when I see that there's an area that has enough layers 
then I can move on to the smoothing process. So I'm keeping one hand here and then one hand dry so that I don't have gluey hands looking through my pieces. And if you have more space, then you can organize it by the size, um, strips and small pieces, and it keeps, keeps your studio quite tidy and easy to work. So I think I'll be adding a few more layers. So one way is to know you've done several layers, and the next way is to actually feel, go by feel. So I'm applying this. So now I've got a few layers and I can start to feel. So now it's okay to get a little bit more messy. And I'm smoothing out and I'm pushing out if there's any, if I press, there might be a little bit of paste that, that comes out depending on how much I put on. But I can also feel the shape of what I'm doing and I rely a lot on the feel. So then I think, okay, well that section feels a little bit low so I need to add a little bit to that and I'm maybe trying to build out this area so then I can continue. Now there's enough of the glue on here or the paste that I could feel and spread around and then keep building on the layers. And then I could even pull a few more pieces. Maybe I want to build right under here and back and then I can feel and add as I place. So similar method all the way along, you just want to work with perhaps some smaller pieces as you go along the narrowness here. And if you want to build out one area, then you can work in that area. Let's say there's a little recess here and you want to build in that area. If it's a big recess, then you can always put some paper, uh, dry paper, and then attach or if you need to fill a hole, then you can use the masking tape. But otherwise, you can continue to spiral and add your layers all the way along. And then again, once I'm happy with that, I just make sure that I can feel and I'm looking at it from all angles. So, especially with a sculpture, you want to make sure that you're looking at it from every side. And that's when you see any gaps or bumps or anything that you have to smooth out to make it fit closer to the shape that you're, you're looking for. So there you go. And if you need to, you know, rework once you're dry, then you have to be very, very careful not to bend. You can shape it when it's wet, but once it dries, then it does get quite rigid. So you want to make sure that you're making all of your decisions well, the paper mache is quite uh, supple and then just give it time to dry in between layers and make sure that you don't do the prep coat or the sealant you need to have lots of time for it to dry and that can depend on the humidity and how many layers you apply and also the amount of, of paste that you're using so there you go